really excited about this episode. I've got Ebony Storm Halliday, uh, writer for The Next Web. She, she also works with a ton of tons of tech leaders out there. I'm really excited to have her on the show and talk about uh, ChatGPT, which is going to be the main thing we're going to focus on on this show. Uh, Ebony, thank you so much for taking the time. And thank you so much for inviting me. Like, I've got to admit, this is new. Like, I'm used to being on the other side of this conversation, <laughs> like asking the questions. So go easy on me here, friend. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will for sure. But I'm, I'm sure you're going to you're going to handle my 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 questions here. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, for people who don't really who haven't seen your work yet. Oh, yeah. I mean, where to start? So. I left formal education when I was 18, 19. I never went to university. Um, it didn't seem right at the time. Um, and when I was 19 years old, I took an apprenticeship with a communications consultancy. And I started developing a career there in social media. Um, about a year and a half later, I went freelance. So at 20 years old, I went freelance. I was remote working from the age of 20, like most mm. of my contracts most of my clients were sort of um social media but then it moved a little bit more into the editorial space then it moved into copywriting and now like basically I sell words for a living which is freaking awesome <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so you know you sell words for a living um now chat GPT can be your personal assistant or even more than that he can basically you know spit out those words that you can sell you know that you can use and sell how do you, what do you think about this 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 is like a revolution to this whole industry and i'm sure like there's a lot of writers out there that are, are still not understanding like the mag magnitude of this what's your take on what's happening oh man so i've been spending a lot of time on linkedin because i'm working on my social media strategy right now like that's been something i've been focused on for the last few months spending a lot of time on LinkedIn and it was like one day a barrage of hashtags about chat GPT came along and just it seemed like everyone in my community had something to say about it or like questions to ask about it um and <laughs> for me I think there's two sides to it like I've got two perspectives here right a person who's curious about tech and who interviews people in tech and writes their stories for a living so a lot of curiosity there like okay this is amazing like how can I try it what, what can I do with it like what's next and then there's also the person who's making a living as a writer and I'm going to be really frank and candid in this conversation because that that's who I am you know that's how I am as a person and I think personally it's it's going to be transformative like a huge proportion of what I do is going to be done better by AI if not now very soon um but in the short term, it's going to create more work for us as writers, like edit editing, like figuring out the right thing to input, like people are literally going to specialize in that. And so I think, you know, there's, there's sort of that narrative, isn't there, about like robots are coming to steal our jobs. Sure, maybe bits of some of them, maybe some of them, but robots are also going to create more jobs. Like <laughs> chat GPT mm -hmm. is already going to create more work for us, right? Um, so I think maybe like a good example in my own business as well is that I use social media tools. Um, I've just started using Buffer again, and I know from their product updates that they're already exploring AI features and implementing new technology. They get that we have to move with and not against technology. And because they embrace it, their users will benefit from it, you know? And so I'm going to benefit from that. Um, I think in the wider context, I think it's really important that employers sort of encourage their teams to play with AI. Like this narrative that robots are going to replace humans has kind of been damaging, I think, to that human tech relationship, because actually, you know, it is a relationship and we need to show tools like ChatGPT as something to engage with as opposed to like something to fear. Um, the more AI and tech takes on these different aspects of work, the more valued that humans will become for their human skills. So we're talking like creativity, we're talking empathy, we're talking critical thinking, like the stuff that makes us really human is going to become increasingly more valuable. Love it. I really love all everything that you just said. 
Um, I want to take you, I want to ask you, um, I want to I want to talk about this example that I've seen uh, this week, and I want to hear your take on this. So I was talking to a tech editor. He's from a really high level uh, tech publication. I'm not going to mention his name or the name of the publication, uh, but I, I sent him a quote from one of our clients and he basically, the quote was very elaborative and, and the client really, you know, gave, you know, and he basically said, um, is this, is this, has this been written by chat GPT or from the person? And I, I literally needed to go out and investigate, you know, w what, what type of, you know, cause it was a really long quote. It was about 600 words. And I went out and started to investigate what was written by the chat GPT and what was edited by, you know, by the client. And I, I, I found this situation to be really weird because, and I really, I'm really interested to hear what, what, what's your take on that. You're probably more close to that than I am. But I, I felt, I, 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 my, my first impression was, my, my immediate reaction was, why is this guy, why is this, you know, tech editor asking me this? What does he care? Because the, the, the content that was provided was definitely valuable. And whatever the mixture of, of that piece of content was, you know, in the end, he will get the same result on his piece that he's writing. So, and then basically the, 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 the my second impression was, was, wait, maybe he has a, a point. Maybe, you know, if everybody starts, you know, mixing those two worlds together, then we won't be able to know what's, you know, uh, what has been written first or, or what not. And then I kind of concluded, you know, with this, uh, I'm, I'm, it's a long story, but I kind of concluded this uh, with myself and with my team, actually, when we said, okay, but the third thing about this, like the third impression we're having on this situation is that if it's not for ChatGPT, the client could have went to Google and basically copy paste the things from Google with, with some minor editing or something. So it doesn't really matter. So I'm really interested to hear what's your take on that. That's such an interesting case study. I think um, <laughs> it comes back to that quote that's like, there's no such thing as an original idea. Do you know what I mean? Or yeah. like, every song is thanks to the Beatles, right? <laughs> I'm probably I know that. from musicians for saying that, but you know, that whole thing. I mean, I've, to be honest, while you were telling me that story, I wrote down a couple of words, um, authenticity and disclosure. I think people, we do crave that authenticity. I mean, look at one of the newest social media apps that's particularly popular with my generation, Be Real. We crave authenticity. So I guess there's kind of that moral issue there that if, if this quote was constructed from, a, from, sorry, from like technology and not a human, then it feels like it it crosses that boundary, right? It doesn't feel quite so authentic. Like, okay, a robot just produced it. Someone didn't sit down and think about it. Um, I think if I was use if I was using this example in my own business, um, I've already thought about the implications of ChatGPT and how I can use it and how I can use it to like deliver better work um, for my clients um, and actually just to benefit my own working processes as well because it's something you've got to think about, right? When you're self-employed. Um, and I think disclosure is massively important so there's sort of a there's a communications piece around this right like if we're going to be using chat gpt in that way i think so long as we are having this conversation and we are being transparent you know we might come to a point where you you go on a website and you see a little indicator like um some little t's and c's type thing at the bottom that says this has been written in combination with chat gpt or whatever mm. you know the next iteration of tool um because i think there will always be especially especially in writing in media and things that we read online and if it's from people that we trust you know we've all got I imagine so many of us have those creators that we go to because we're like I love them I can think of a few right now who've really helped me develop my freelance business and you know if I started reading those creators work or like um consuming their content and that it wasn't disclosed or like <sighs> Yeah, if it wasn't disclosed, I wonder how I would feel about that. Of course, we might just get to a point where it's oh, it's assumed that things mm -hmm. are, you know, a combination of human and artificial intelligence. And and then it might be okay. And then we might think, hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. but right now, it's very new and very fresh, right? So I think in my own business, yeah, I it's something that, like, I want to be really open and transparent about. 
Okay, I love that. I love that. And I'll counter question. I'll, I'll kind of counter question. Uh, um, let me let me know what you think. So, you know, when ChatGPT first like uh, launched, I think like a month ago, maybe two months ago. So basically, it wasn't like the first immediate reaction for people. Maybe for writers it was, but for most people it was okay. This is going to replace Google search. They didn't think about it. Hey, this is going to generate a whole article for me, right? They were like, hey, I'm going to be able to chat. It's called chat GPD, which means you can chat with it, right? So that's that's the, the basic notion. And what, what, what I'm saying is this, look at this. So where do people acquire their initial knowledge from? They acquire their initial knowledge from, let's say, school, okay? School or Google or watching YouTube videos, uh, and then the other part of, of the acquired knowledge is by doing, is by experimenting, is by actually doing. Now, I, I, I think that ChatGPT is here to replace school and Google search, but it's not going to replace the doing. And I feel like right now, too many people and too many editors, um, or I don't know if too many, but at least the editor that I talk to, they 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 put it too much emphasis on if this was generated by AI or because in, you know, in the end, in the end, like you can have, let's say this client, you know, the knowledge that my client and my client got for on that specific, specific case study, he probably, he could have got that in school or by, you know, going to Google or by, you know, and, 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 he, and he probably wouldn't base that only on that. He would probably mix some of his own experience to it as well. So the end product would look exactly the same. So what, what do you think about that? Like in terms of, you know, we already have systems like the school system and the education system, and we have platforms like YouTube, Twitter, who kind of generate, you know, ideas and, and, and content that is not original. It is, it's a mix of things. I love what you said about the Beatles. Um, and, and yeah, so what do you think about that? What do you think about this kind of debate? I love that. And I really just want to like high five you through the screen mm -hmm. because I think it's such an important question. Yeah, seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so something I made a note of earlier, I, I was reading something earlier. It was a DigiDay article and it was, can chat GPT fill in mentorship, mentorship gaps for Gen Z workers? I don't know if you've seen this. Um, I haven't read the article. I absolutely love it. So um, a lot of um, sort of like the, the younger and so I'm top end of Gen Z. I'm 26 this year, but I've been in the working world for like six, seven years now. Right. So we're talking about the Gen Zs who got jobs during the pandemic or like are only now going into um, organizations and discovering that, you know, a, a lot more of them have like a hybrid or remote work set up, etc. Um, many of them are struggling with like corporate and workplace skills and of course they are because they've not had the context because maybe they've joined a company um, like in the middle of the pandemic so everyone was remote working working from home um, and they've joined at that point and so their communications with colleagues have been like this or, mm -hmm. over, or whatever instant messenger platform they're using and they've not actually had that environmental experience and so we're already talking about how chat gpt can plug that gap and mm. that's awesome like that's amazing so uh the, the way that they applied it was basically um if a young person has a question about like how they would approach a manager for a raise or like having a conversation about annual leave etc they can ask chat gpt like how would you word that and okay it's not going to be perfect and it's going to lack personalization because you know the ai doesn't have the unique context of their um of their question but it is going to provide them with a little bit of a nudge a little bit of guidance mm -hmm. and it's supplementary to actual mentorship and i think that's what's important here is that we talk about how it can be supplementary it's not a replacement again we're not replacing humans right technology i don't think truly ever replaces us it displaces us moves us around a little bit shakes us hmm. up right? nice <laughs> that's like a that's like a twitter quote like you should tweet this out you know it doesn't you know yeah that's that that was a strong one for sure you know earlier earlier in the conversation you mentioned that there were some creators that really helped you kind of build your own you know freelance business um would you mind sharing who some of those people were 
Absolutely. Um, so one of them, um, Anna Cudriarado, um, mm. she's an incredible advocate for freelancers. Um, I absolutely adore her work. Um, we've worked together once or twice over the years and I, yeah, I think she's a really fantastic person and she had this, um, incredible email newsletter. Um, oh, oh my goodness, what was it called? I will send, if I, I, I will look for it and I'll send you a link and you can pop it in, in the YouTube description, but, um, yeah, um, incredible newsletter and it just like it was something that would arrive in my inbox you know every week every few weeks and I'd I'd feel like I wasn't alone in starting this <laughs> you know like sometimes you do right and like a lot of my friends um that I've sort of been friends with for a long time I think at first looked at me a little bit like I was insane when I was like I'm striking <laughs> out on my own and <laughs> would I have had the guts to do it now probably not like I had the guts because I was like a naive 20 year old and that you know that powered me so Anna's awesome um another like a, another mentor friend incredible person uh, Lauren Rizavi um I will also link you to her because she's doing incredible things that I can't even begin to explain mm -hmm. but again just sort of a great advocate um and yeah like as a writer as well I um I learned so much from her um I learned so much from her editing my work as well like mm -hmm. that, that was a big one um and yeah just just an all-round incredible person I think I seek out people who are carving out a business path um of their own like re, you know carving it out in a way that works for them because that's ultimately what I'm looking for and I think it's a conversation that I seem to be having a lot it's like okay so during the pandemic like um work shifted quite a lot um and a lot of people experienced new ways of working that they hadn't had the access to before and I think it forced us to reconsider what actually works for us hmm. um and so it's a conversation that I'm having a look um, having a lot and so I always look for like influencers and sort of mentors who are doing things their own way yeah I, I hear you completely so you know just for some context I didn't go I didn't go study in a university I didn't you know I I, I didn't want to work for anyone I I really I really early on like understood that um I'm 27 so I'm, I'm one year older than you and you know, basically, I I knew that I want to forge my own my own business, my own path, and I always I since I remember myself, I always saw things differently. When I was in school, I would get in trouble because I was like I was think I was like everyone was like doing you know this, and I wanted to do that right, and you know, and I think like I think in, in some way that the current education system I don't know how it is currently in the UK. But I think education, uh, the education system needs to be uh, a bit more, a bit better in my, uh, not a bit, much more better uh, and much more flexible, I think, with, with people who don't, who are, who, who see things differently, who act differently, who, who, and, you know, who, 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 who have a skill set that is not, is not, you know, is not specifically, um, you know, this cookie cutter box of school, but is a skill set that can do wonders you know out in the real world which is the most important thing and another thing that i've been seeing and you know if we're already talking about schools and education systems is you know i've been i've been seeing people who, who grew up with me and they were like they were they were hustling in school you know at the time when i was just you know going out and playing basketball and flunking and, and you know just basically not going into class and you know so they were like hustling to get those grades and then when they you know went out to the real world they were they were so fed up with this you know with doing something that they don't like to do that mm -hmm. you know all those years where they you know all the things they did in school doesn't really matter maybe it matters you know in their work ethic or something like that but you know they ended up feeling like school kind of like um you know kind of like you know played them in a, in a way right so i wonder like what what do you think about this if, if you think the same way so it's really tricky because i think um schools have an incredible problem right now in that the world is moving so quickly that as soon as you set a curriculum i imagine it's becoming outdated pretty fast right yeah. like how, how long have has you know social media hasn't been or social media hasn't been around as long as i have and i consider hmm. myself pretty young right and then if we move that 
that forward a little bit, like everything that's happened in the last 10 years alone, like even actually we can talk about the last two to three years, the pandemic, how basically all of knowledge work was shifted to a remote work sphere and how actually a lot of it's staying there now because people have realized, hang on, I don't have to be in an, if I've got my laptop, I've got my phone, I can probably do my job sort of wherever I want, you know, that's sort of the realization that we're coming to. And I think, I think there are new educators on the scene as well. I think that's something that we probably need to cover is that um, the way I think about it is um, my, my job, my career, everything that I do is sort of thanks to the internet. Mm -hmm. so when I, <laughs> I'm like, I can't, you know, it's that combined with the fact that I met incredible mentors in my first job, that I've had incredible freelance colleagues throughout my career. Um, and that has really, really supported my development and just been amazing. I can't, you know, say that it isn't due to the relationships I've created as well, because I think relationships are one of the most important driving forces in your education and in your career. Right. right. But um, also the Internet. When I got my first freelance contract, I was doing social media for a cosmetics company. Um, I was doing their social media, their blog and their email newsletter. Everything I learned. I learned from the internet. I mean the technical stuff. There are mentoring things that happened with the people around me, but I mean like I didn't know how to do a keyword search and then include them in a blog post until I got that contract and I was like, right, I, I want to do a good job of this. Let's figure this out. I did the courses. I did the research. I watched the videos. All of that happened online, right? So the internet has sort of become this educator as well. And there are issues with that too, but the internet in itself has sort of become an educator now and I think this links back to our conversation that we we're having about chat GPT right because one of the things I was thinking about earlier today is that chat GPT is probably going to be to the younger generation what the internet was to me and my mm. career that's what created opportunities for me right and I do believe that chat GPT and like further iterations and other different AI ML te technologies they are going to do the same hmm that is that that is amazing, and I love what you said about like the, you 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 owe a lot to the internet because it, it really yeah. and, and and me too, and I think everyone in our generation does. Mm. Um, you know, and this takes me to another question. And um, you know, one of one of uh, one of my favorite tech entrepreneurs is uh, Jack Dorsey. Uh, I really love Jack Dorsey. For people who don't know, he's the he's one of the founders of Twitter and the founder uh, one of the co-founder of Square. And, you know, he's been a big advocate on, on like open source and the internet and how it helped him. And I love the way he's, he's able to focus. And I, I love, I, I love like uh, listening to his interviews. I think he's a super insightful person. Um, what are some tech personalities, you know, famous ones that have kind of, that you look at them, that you kind of Google about them and that you're really kind of fascinated about them? Oh, uh, this is really bad because I can think of one tech personality and I haven't got her name to hand, um, but I read her book recently. It's called Purposeful, and it's about managing purposeful organizations. Now, I believe she's the head of groups at Facebook, and she's the ex-CEO. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl, Cheryl Sand, uh, no. No, I'll, I'll again, be, I'm me, sending yeah. you so much stuff at the, at the end of this interview, so <laughs> apologies in advance, but For yeah. Sure. Um, and she wrote a book about leading pur purposeful organizations and i think um that the reason i'm interested in her and her work and her personality i i suppose is that um purpose is now the thing that i feel that i'm seeking and actually more and more of the tech startups and the tech companies that i interview that i speak to and that i create content for um are like okay, we've done the thing, we've built the business, we've raised all of that money, we don't, you know, we did, we did the thing, we did the thing that everyone's aspiring to do. Now, how can we do something purposeful? Like, mm. what's next? Like, how can we have an impact on the world? And I think um, whenever I'm sort of seeking out new influences that inspire me, they're often not tech, but a, a lot of the perspectives can be related back to tech. Um, I think that's what I'm looking for. People who are looking for a purpose sort of beyond the company and sort of externally. Mm -hmm. So I, w w her name is, is her name Jennifer Dolsky by any chance? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes. That, I Googled, I Googled, uh, I Googled, uh, the book. 
Yeah, awesome. So it's Jennifer Dolsky for people who want to read the book. Um, any other um, book recommendations for our audience? Yes, I did write one down earlier because I was I had a feeling that you might ask me about it. <laughs> I asked it in ask it in every interview. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not that I've been snooping on your YouTube channel or anything. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. <laughs> no. Um so one of my favorite books, and I think I can link this a little bit to chat GPT. Again, it's a little bit tenuous, but um Rutger Bregman, uh Utopia for Realists. Hmm. Um this was a really transformative book for me and it changed my perspective on a lot of ways things work in fact i think you would love it omri because he talks about how um he talks about how the education system needs to change um to sort of reflect how our world is changing um but one of the things he covers is universal basic income and i think mm. um it's a really in interesting conversation i think we'll be having more conversations about it now um, as chat GPT develops and other AI and ML technologies develop because if we get to this point where say like 50% of um, all work can be automated, can be done by robots, so half of all work, half of all jobs say, um, then the idea that um, our kind of economy and society, like the fundamental principle is that you go to work, you earn money, you exchange it for goods and services <laughs> that becomes a little fragile right if like 50 percent of all jobs are done are done by robots so um yeah i would highly recommend utopia for realists um it's a fantastic mm. book and it really forces you to think about some of the structures that we sort of yeah that we we work within wait what what does he what does he offer then what does he like okay if 50 percent of the you know of the workforce is robots then what do humans do? Does he mention that in the book? Does he give a glimpse to? That's just an that's just an example that I'm sort of offering mm -hmm. of like okay, um, that that would perhaps be an argument for universal basic income. That's mm. not something that features in the book, but um, yeah, you're asking the right question, right? Because what if if we get to that point, what is next then? Because surely things can't operate on the same sort of structure that we have right now. You know, so I've heard Sam uh, Sam Altman, who is the mm -hmm. CEO of OpenAI, uh, who does ChatGPT. I, I heard him talk about universal uh, basic income, and I have to be honest, I haven't really uh, dug uh, too deep into this term and what does it actually mean. Can you kind of elaborate a bit for your audience? Um, and, and what does because you know it's it's it, it you know, universal basic income basically means that there's going to be a, 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 an income that goes on and gets distributed right to everyone. And that's like a starting base. Is, is that it? Is that, and then people build on that starting base. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm probably not the most or most technical person who can deliver like, you know, a really good definition of this. So take what I say with a grain of salt and like definitely give it a good Google afterwards. Um, <laughs> or ChatGPT, or give it a good ChatGPT. Hey, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, basically, you you pretty much got it spot on as I understand it as well. Um, so again, take it with a grain of salt, but that um, everyone is given a certain amount of income um, from the government, from the state, um, and you then have the choice. It's it will be a level of income that is enough to like live on, I believe. Mm -hmm then you sort of have that choice of whether um, you decide to supplement that with additional work or you live on that. Like you, you've sort of got options then, right? Mm. Um, and I think it's an interesting one because I have a lot of conversations with people who are really uh, disillusioned by work and disillusioned by their jobs and who would 100% be doing different things if they were not dependent on their job now, mm. for right? I feel like we've yeah. all had these conversations with people and, you know, um, it, universal basic income could really make that a reality right because if you've got enough enough to live on then you can either decide to devote your time to like honing your craft or creating something else maybe you don't want to do any kind of labor in exchange for money and cool like you do you but um you yeah the, the options are there that's what it is it, it then gives people choice about um how they work and how much work they choose to do Hmm. Actually, for like writers, like not necessarily tech writers, but basically, you know, like authors, like people who mm. write books, 
maybe it's a really good option for them because they they can sit you know in a cabin somewhere you know lo low cost cabin you know eat their, their three meals a day and just write books until they they get a hit and it makes them famous and stuff right i'm so um, that's what yeah. i'm gonna do <laughs> 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 so you know you've been super generous uh generous uh generous with your time i have one last question um mm -hmm. for you how does how do you structure your work day what are some of your, like your productivity tips or hacks that you kind of do throughout your day oh i love this question um i'm probably going to be really boring so um <laughs> um mm -hmm. i try to avoid caffeine because i'm one of those people who gets really twitchy um when i drink caffeine so i also try and have like a, a protein and and healthy fat dense breakfast i try and set myself up well um i know i work best between 8 a.m and 12 p.m mm. so i try to do i structure my day so that like focus writing happens within those hours um so that will usually be when i'm sort of drafting content or drafting content ideas or strategizing um and then sort of afternoon i will leave that for admin and lighter tasks that's the point where i'm starting to struggle with brain power um so my goal this year is a four day week but i don't mean like a regimented like i do these four days i just mean like um if we say four days is like 30 32 hours that's that's sort of like the amount of hours that i will do a week my goal is always to work less and do better <laughs> so i want to make sure that the work i'm doing is like really kicks ass but um i don't want to be doing loads and loads of it because i know that the less i do and the more focused i am with it the better um i highly recommend yoga if you've got a brain that's always doing crazy things um and maybe lifting a few weights here and there as well helps but i like to work out before i actually start working too i think um giving yourself as much time um without your phone in the morning and like a distraction sort of a distraction free morning is really good i'm trying to delay like putting my earphones in now because i've sort of um heard a few different stories from people who have spoken about like okay what happens if you um we get so used to so much stimulation mm -hmm. that we are constantly searching for it and obviously constantly searching for that dopamine hit and it's really like not good for our brain power so i'm trying to like you know leave all of that mental stimulation and all the scrolling through my phone till later on and like really go for the focus work in the morning um i hope that's helpful it was a bit convoluted it's amazing it's amazing um so do you so so follow-up questions do you mm -hmm. um do you wake up then at around 6 6 a.m around 7 usually seven. Um, yeah but uh earlier in the summer i really struggled with the dark um as you can mm -hmm. see i'm very pale too so like i need to get that daylight um and i struggle to wake up <laughs> and in terms of um in terms okay so what you said and let me analyze this a bit because it's really interesting mm. is you kind of work like a lion you know like there's you know naval ravikant he's a he's a so he talks about you know, working like a lion, you know, it's better to do four hours of focused work mm -hmm. than to, you know, to work eight hours and to kind of just move through the motions. Also, mm -hmm. my friend, Ryan Breslow, he works like that. And by the way, Ryan Breslow, he's the founder of Bolt and they have a four, four day work week. Mm -hmm. The whole company has a four day work week and they, they kind of uh, work like that as well. And I really feel like this is a, a trend that people are more uh, into right now, which is um, do you work when you work, you work, but when you don't work, you, you're able to kind of, you know, be, you know, be with your family and friends. Um, I'm personally a bit of a workaholic, so I find it kind of harder to kind of disconnect from work. Um, especially when, you know, like you said, it, you have your phone next to you, you have your iPad next to you. Yeah. So you're constantly, you know, you know, it, it, you know, with work. But I, I would say that I personally, I'm not addicted to social media. I'm not like addicted to the notifications. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I just like to producing, a, I like producing a lot of content. So I, you know, but I don't consume as much as I produce, which I think is a good thing. But, um, but yeah, I think you're, I think you're, I think you're definitely, definitely have a great productivity routine for sure. I hope so. Because <laughs> well, I don't to get done. <laughs> yeah. It's all about the results. It's all about yeah. the results. And you definitely, and you're definitely, uh, kick, you know, 
kicking ass. So I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm really happy that it, this productivity routine is working for you. So Abney, uh, you know, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to, this conversa to do this conversation. If people want to follow you, um, where can they find you? LinkedIn is probably the best place um i tend to be a little bit more longer form than twitter at the minute mm -hmm. um also instagram um i'll be relaunching my newsletter in the next month it's going to be focused on our changing relationship with work so if that's something nice. you're interested in, yeah yeah i'm excited nice <laughs> if it's something um your audience is interested in then all of my updates are on linkedin and instagram so had that um do you um okay Cool. Do you have a, do you have, is the newsletter live yet? Like do you, can the audience subscribe somewhere or? I don't think it's alive. I don't know whether I want to draw attention uh, to the landing page yet. <laughs> got <laughs> it. Some, there are some edits to make, but I can probably. Got it. It. But you can count me in as a subscriber. You can oh. add my email. Thanks so much. Thank awesome, you. Ebony. Thank you so much for doing this and oh, have an awesome day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Bye.